Thank you. That concludes topical questions. The next item of business is consideration of business motion 13356 in the name of Jamie Hepburn on behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau setting out a timetable for the Stage 3 consideration of the Visitor Levy Scotland Bill. I ask any member who wishes to speak to the motion to press their request to speak button. And I call on Martin Whitfield to move the motion. Thank you, Mr Whitfield. No member has asked to speak to the motion. Therefore, the question is that motion 13356 be agreed. Are we all agreed? The motion is therefore agreed. The next item of business is Stage 3 Proceedings on the Visitor Levy Scotland Bill. In dealing with the amendments, members should have the Bill as amended at Stage 2, that is Scottish Parliament Bill 28A, the revised marshalled list and the groupings of amendments. The division bell will sound and proceedings will be suspended for around five minutes for the first division of the Stage 3. The period of voting for the First Division will be 45 seconds and thereafter I will allow a voting period of one minute for the First Division after a debate. Members who wish to speak in the debate on any group of amendments should press their request to speak buttons or enter RTS in the chat. Members should now refer to the marshalled list of amendments. And we go to Group 1, Payment of the Levy. And I call Amendment 21 in the name of Miles Briggs, grouped with Amendment 33. Miles Briggs to move Amendment 21 and speak to both amendments in the group. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, amendment 21 and 33 are both probing amendments around how and when the levy will be paid and how small businesses tasked with the administration of the collection and recording uh, will be best able to undertake the duties outlined in the Bill. Firstly, I believe it is important that the Government has a consistent approach to the collection of the levy and we ensure that visitors um, do not pay the levy twice and, importantly, also for businesses tasked with becoming tax collectors, as they now will. Um, that they have the most simple way of recording and receiving levy payments um, that they have to personally account for. Uh, we know the significant shift which we have seen towards online booking platforms, and many businesses are now operating mixed booking systems and indeed mixed check-in models. I therefore hope that these amendments can provide uh, for the Government to take forward clear clarification set out in statutory guidance which Ministers will develop um, around the collection of the levy and, and any flexibilities that can provide. Thank you. I call Daniel Johnson. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. I mean, given the, that Miles Briggs has set out that this is a probing amendment that makes my point moot, I, I, I fully accept the, the point that, that Miles Briggs makes, just in terms of ensuring that we, we have uh, the providers at the heart of this, and, and critically making sure uh, that, that uh, you know, we're not driving money into the hands of uh, third parties. However, my concern in terms of looking at this was whether or not actually it would uh, uh, get in the way of the way that business is done, particularly if people are using credit cards, other online payment methods, which are a core part of the way that the tourism business works. So I'd be grateful for the, the, the comments from the Minister, um, but, and we'll, we'll uh, hear what he has to say. But obviously I understand the sentiment, but I have concerns about the practicality. I call the Minister. Thank you, Presiding Officer. These uh, amendments relate to the arrangements for paying a visitor levy if, if a local authority chooses to introduce one. Under the Bill, the overnight accommodation provider is responsible for collecting and remitting the visitor levy to the relevant local authority. Under the Bill, the liability, however, falls on the accommodation provider, as this is a more practical and sensible approach than it falling on individual visitors. Given that compliance action against individuals who may live in other countries would be impractical and uneconomic to collect. Miles Briggs' amendments both relate to the practical arrangements for the payment of a levy and, in the Government's view, make it more difficult for businesses to collect and remit the levy. Amendment 21 would require a visitor to pay a visitor levy only at the overnight accommodation. That would severely limit the options that an accommodation provider had to collect a levy as it would mean a visitor levy could only pay the levy at the actual overnight accommodation. This would, for example, stop the levy being collected online when a booking was made if the accommodation was paid for in advance. 
It is also unclear how this would work in a situation where a self-catering property was using a key box or similar arrangement for check-in. Turning to Amendment 33, this would again limit the flexibilities accommodation providers have to make administrative arrangements around a visitor levy. It would remove the ability for an accommodation provider to make an arrangement with a third party to collect a visitor levy. This would, for example, prevent an online travel agent from collecting a visitor levy on behalf of an accommodation provider for those bookings made through using this sort of platform. Under the Bill as drafted, such arrangements can be made if an accommodation provider wants to do so. The Government wants to give accommodation providers the flexibility to enter into such arrangements if it wants, to enable them to collect and remit a visitor levy in the way that works best for that business. And that is why the Government therefore does not support um, Amendment 33. I very much appreciate the points that um, Mr Briggs has raised in bringing them forward and for affording the opportunity to consider these issues. And I would want to ensure Mr Briggs that I think the importance around flexibility and to ensure the most effective administration is absolutely critical for the success of any visitor levy that a local authority introduces. And I would want to reassure the member um, that it is my expectation that these matters will be engaged um, through the statutory guidance and I, of course, will be happy to discuss that matter further with any members should Parliament agree to pass the bill. Thank you. I call Miles Briggs to wind up and press or withdraw Amendment uh, 21. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And I've listened to what the Minister has had to say. I think it is important, and, and this will be in the detail of when this is operational, that for many businesses, how and when they will get this data from online booking platforms and how that will then be able to be reported back uh, without them facing any penalties is something we do need to see more clarification on. That's why I brought forward these uh, amendments. So, listening to what the Minister has had to say, um, I'm happy enough not to move um, Amendment 21 or 33. Um, if I can confirm, Mr Briggs, that you're withdrawing Amendment 21. Thank you. Mr Briggs has indicated that he wishes to withdraw the amendment. And we move on to Group 2, Meaning of Overnight Accommodation. And I call Amendment 22 in the name of Miles Briggs, grouped with amendments as shown in the groupings. And I point out that if Amendment 23 is agreed to, I cannot call Amendment 24 due to a preemption. So Miles Briggs to move Amendment 22 and speak to all amendments in the group. Th thank you, President Officer. This set of amendments seeks to remove camping sites, hostels and caravans uh, from places considered to be overnight accommodation included within the Bill. During the passage of the Bill, the argument put forward that a, mix, a fixed rate would see minimal additional costs to visitors has now been superseded with the percentage rate which is now included within the Bill and which the Government supports. Um, we have therefore seen um, the potential of £1 or £2 levy become a up to 10% at least uh, charge on all accommodation. Now, during the cost of living crisis, many people have looked to have a cheaper holiday, and indeed many Scots discovered just how wonderful our country is for holidaying during the pandemic uh, restrictions. The bill has the potential to significantly add costs to family holidays and families in Scotland holidaying at home. I looked online yesterday, for example, at a campsite near Fort William, which the Deputy First Minister uh, may know. For a week's family holiday, for two adults and two children in a large tent pitch, it would cost £224 uh, for next week. With the tourist levy, that will add a potential additional £22 to that cost. Significant concerns have also been expressed around many hostels and how they are administered. And I know the Minister is actually live uh, to these issues. Presiding officer, for Scots seeking a more affordable holiday, often the choice is to book a campsite, hostel or caravan accommodation. Adding a potential 10% to what is fundamentally a self-catering holiday is going to directly hit the pockets of Scots trying to enjoy an affordable stay staycation in their own country. The Scottish Government has also in recent uh, years promoted the diversification of agribusinesses and for many that has seen the development of the provision of camping and caravan pitches even though this is not the main uh, business interest that they have or source of income for their business. For many these um, are also important in terms of the provision of additional accommodation provided for agricultural shows, for example, or local concerts and, and local art festivals, which might just be one-off events. 
We know that there are also significant cross-party concerns regarding the ongoing issue of wild camping and the damage this often causes to our natural environment, as well as um, the limited but often unacceptable cases of antisocial behaviour that we have seen. For people, above all, though, on a fixed budget trying to save money and not having to pay an accommodation tax, I think, is important. And, not, and booking a campsite or caravan park, uh, that is often uh, what they are intending to, to be able to achieve. The additional costs, therefore, that a visitor levy will bring could indeed si see significant behavioural changes changes and increase the number of wild camping and overnight parking of caravans in laybys and passing places. Um, and that is something I don't think any of us necessarily have understood, or the government certainly hasn't understood the un unintended consequences this bill may therefore have. I therefore believe that these amendments are proportionate and hope members across Parliament will support them. And I move amendments uh, 22 to 29 in my name. Thank you. I call Liam MacArthur to speak to Amendment 1 and other amendments in the group. Thank you, President Officer. The underlying uh, principle of, of this legislation is about empowering local uh, authorities, local councils, uh, to be able to raise revenues to invest in services and in infrastructure uh, upon which the tourism sector, but also the local communities, um, rely. I think the, the Minister has already referred in relation to earlier amendments about the importance of flexibility uh, for local authorities to meet local needs and circumstances. Um, I think recognising the fact that the tourism sector um, differs in different parts of the country and also differs at different po uh, points in the year. Uh, but I think it's also important that we don't land uh, local authorities with a poison chalice. And I think fundamental to that is ensuring a degree of, of fairness um, so that the, the legislation that we apply um, and the way in which local authorities can use it does not appear to single out one section of the, uh, of the tourism sector while excluding uh, others. Now, we've seen over recent years uh, in my own Orkney constituency, but I think across certainly the Highlands and Islands, um, quite a dramatic rise in the number of, of, of motorhomes um, making up uh, part of the, uh, the, the, the tourism sector, but more indeed still in relation to, to cruise traffic. Now, I'm not um, trying to make an argument about whether that's a good thing or a bad thing. I think that's for um, another, another debate. But what is, I think, beyond doubt is the fact that um, those increased volumes are putting additional pressure on services and on infrastructure in Orkney and in other parts of the, the country. And I think if this legislation is to command um, public confidence as well as confidence within the sector, I think a recognition, fact, uh, a recognition of that fact um, is required. I think there's also the question of the administrative costs for operating uh, any scheme that a council brings forward. And I think excluding um, thing, um, cruise traffic, motorhomes and others, while including hotels, bed and breakfasts and uh, self-catering, uh, does run the risk of, of local authorities. I know that's the case uh, in relation to Orkney Islands Council, of um, that, that uh, costing more to operate than they are likely to be able to recoup um, through any uh, revenue. Now, I understand uh, from the exchanges I had with the Minister at, at stage two that there are complications in terms of trying to incorporate um, these provisions within this uh, piece of, of legislation. And I would certainly well, um, thank the, the Minister for his constructive engagement ahead of stage two and uh, ahead of uh, stage three. Um, I understand that there have been ongoing discussions with local authorities and that the Minister is committed to continuing those to find a way forward both in terms of cruise traffic, but I think also in terms of, of motorhomes, uh, perhaps um, identifying ways of applying that in an island setting where obviously um, the requirement to, to travel into the islands and within the islands uh, by ferry it open, opens up opportunities that are maybe not available for operating a scheme on the Scottish uh, mainland. Uh, I recognise that that process will take some time in order to get the, the, the detail right, but I think it's important uh, that in terms of the choreography of what local authorities are able to do in, in the introduction of a visitor levy that applies uh, to those uh, businesses that are captured by this legislation, but also allows those local authorities to apply it with a degree of fairness to crews and to other uh, elements of the, uh, of the tourism sector, that that uh, work is taken forward um, in, uh, with good speed um, and that the necessary legislation that would be required to introduce it um, is brought forward 
in this parliamentary uh, session. So again, I thank the Minister for his engagement on, on this. Uh, despite having rushed to introduce the amendments, which secured them uh, uh, numbers one and two in the list, in the list I can confirm as with stage two, I don't intend to uh, press them to a vote, but um, to use them as a means to allow the Minister to put on the record uh, the commitment the Scottish Government to take forward that consultation and legislation in due course. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr MacArthur. And I call on the Minister to speak to Amendment 3 and other amendments in the group. Minister. These amendments all concern the types of overnight accommodation on which the levy is payable, and I am pleased to have the opportunity to respond to them. First of all, Amendments 1 and 2 from Liam MacArthur set out, which Liam MacArthur has set out in this chamber, allow me to set out the Government's position with regards to a cruise ship levy and a levy on motorhomes. I am very grateful to Mr MacArthur for the constructive engagement ahead of Stage 3. On a cruise ship levy, the Government is open to introducing such a levy and exploring the detailed mechanisms required to operate it. We will, therefore, be engaging with local authorities the cruise ship industry and other stakeholders over the coming months to explore this issue further and develop more detailed proposals. I want to thank COSLA for the work they have carried out, which will be a useful starting point for those discussions. Later in this year, I can confirm that we look to launch a public consultation to formally hear the views of those affected by such a levy and to consider further the impacts on businesses, local government and others building on the constructive engagement we have had in the development of the visitor levy uh, process. And indeed, uh, ministers would be happy to engage with members with an interest in a proposed cruise ship levy. Turning to motorhomes, these are again an important part of the visitor economy and used by many people to explore the more rural parts of Scotland and our many islands. Recent research by Visit Scotland has shown the benefits they can bring as part of the visitor economy. However, I know motorhomes can also place a particular pressure on smaller communities, and there is understandably a view that they should pay some kind of levy. The Government is open to discussion with stakeholders on this issue and will consider any developed proposals that will work to support the visitor economy. Discussions with Council and land management stakeholders have highlighted significant practical issues with a levy on motorhomes with potential difficulties in application, administration and compliance. However, the Government's door very much remains open to discussion on this issue and to any workable, workable proposals that can be brought forward. And I would want to note the suggestion that Liam MacArthur has made around the opportunities for the app potential application of such a levy on an island setting. So I would want to um, reaffirm the Government's commitments in these areas and to make clear um, that I am committed to engaging on these matters, are, as are my ministerial colleagues. And indeed, I will be looking to engage over the summer, both on a cruise levy and indeed on potential further measures that we can explore with regards to motorhomes. So having outlined that and having uh, made these commitments, I would um, ask, as uh, Liam MacArthur does not press his amendments. I now turn to Miles Briggs amendments 22, 23 and 25, which would remove from the scope of a visitor levy campsites, hostels and caravan parks and make it impossible for a local authority to include them in their visitor levy scheme. Where there is a strong consensus between and among local government and the tourism sector that a type of accommodation should be removed from the scope of a visitor levy, the Government is open to removing that accommodation type. As members may remember, this happened with boat moorings and berthings earlier in the passage of this Bill. However, I have to say there is no such consensus on the issues of campsites, caravan sites and hostels. Such accommodation types are an important part of the tourist offering in Scotland, offering lower cost accommodation and a different type of experience. The Government's approach to a visitor levy takes this into account, with a percentage charge for the levy reflecting the generally cheaper cost of these types of accommodation. In some parts of Scotland, these types of accommodation are much more prevalent than in others, and removal would therefore disproportionately affect some local authorities more than others. Removal would also clearly reduce the level of income a local authority would receive from a visitor levy, which would in turn affect the level of funds available to be invested in the visitor economy. The Government therefore does not support these amendments and I would ask Miles Briggs not to press them. Amendment 24 seeks to include campsites only where the provision of camping pitches is 
the primary income of the business. I appreciate where Miles Briggs is coming from in this amendment, but it is not one that the government can support. Businesses may have a variety of income streams, and these may fluctuate over time depending on conditions in the wider economy. How would the exclusion operate when the amendment is unclear on how primary income is defined and over what time frame? This is again an amendment that would disproportionately affect some local authorities more than others. And in absence of a national consensus, I do not want to remove the flexibility from local authorities or be able to determine accommodation providers for their individual schemes. I would therefore ask Miles Briggs not to press Amendment 24. Similarly, Amendments 26 and 27 from Miles Briggs seek to reflect situations where income from caravan and camping pitches are not the main focus of a business. Again, this is something the government believes is best left to local authorities to, to decide on what is a local tax in the absence of any consensus between local government and the tourism industry. Flexibility would be needed to define what is ancillary and what would happen if this changed over the course of time. The government, therefore, does not support these amendments. Amendments 20 and 29 seek to exempt the provision of caravan and camping pitches for a festival or event. I understand the thinking behind these amendments, but in the absence of a consensus, the government does not support them. There are also problems with these amendments at a practical level. For example, how they would apply to a general purpose campsite where some of those staying are taking part in a particular event and others staying there are not. I would therefore ask Miles Briggs not to press this amendment. My own amendment three in this group is largely technical and I would ask members to support it. The amendment makes the consultation requirements for regulations under section four consistent with consultation requirements elsewhere in the bill. I would like to, presiding officer, make one final point in respect to the points raised by many of the amendments in this group. Under the bill, a local authority seeking to introduce a scheme will be required to consult before any scheme is introduced and would be able to exclude certain types of accommodation. This is a decision which, in the absence of a national consensus, is best made at a local level. I am, however, very willing to continue the discussion with MSPs from all parties if there are types of accommodation they believe should be excluded using the powers in Section 4 of the Bill. At present, however, the Government does not believe it is right to take that step without a clear consensus among local government and the tourism industry. The Bill seeks to introduce a local tax, and as part of empowering local government, seeks to give local authorities the powers and responsibilities to make decisions that are right for their area. Thank you. And I call Ariane Burgess. Thank you. Uh, given the uh, pressures on coastal and island communities brought by cruise ships, I did want to just speak to Liam MacArthur's amendment. So the Scottish Greens secured a commitment with the Scottish Government to introduce the cruise ship levy last year while we were in government. And I think it is absolutely essential that our uh, islands uh, and coastal communities deserve a properly considered piece of legislation and uh, I'm, it's good to hear the Minister's assurances that work is going to be ongoing on this uh, work which is complex and practicalities of cruise ship levy needs to be worked out. We need to find uh, the appropriate legal mechanism and we Scottish Greens will continue to work constructively constructively with the Scottish Government, communities and stakeholders to deliver a levy which works for ports, harbours, island and our coastal communities. And on the point of motorhomes, uh, in the considerations around that approach, and I think that's one of the things that have been uh, since stage two or since the beginning, the, the challenges around what's the triggering point of a motorhome. And I think Liam MacArthur's amendment around the idea of a trigger when a motorhome uh, takes a journey to an island works, but it doesn't work for mainland motorhomes. But I wonder if the Minister has uh, seen the work being done recently in Venice, where they have introduced an app and a QR code that requires uh, visitors to uh, Venice to pay a fee, a daily fee, and I think that that might be something that is worth considering in ongoing work on, in both of these measures. Thank you. And I call Emma Roddick. 
you, Presiding Officer. Um, regarding Amendments 23 and 24, I do share the concerns of, of constituents and business owners in my region that the impact of implementing a charge at a caravan or a holiday park could mean the displacement of motorhomes and caravans to laybys or farms or, or people's gardens. Um, but as the Minister mentioned, local authorities can decide what to cover and the situation may well be different in different areas of Scotland and those local authorities will know better than I. So I do look forward to the Highland Council's consultation on this. I'm sure that my constituents who made strong representations to me can do so in that process as well. And in light of that, I do think that instead of throwing out motorhomes and camping sites altogether as these amendments seek to, we should explore how to catch all non-resident or gypsy traveller motorhomes which are making use of our roads, often to unsustainable levels like we see every year in Sky and across the North Coast 500. Um, they could be charged at entry points like the Sky Bridge, a point on the North Coast 500 or when disembarking from ferries, either physically or through a licence plate recognition system. These vehicles do damage our roads. They present costs to the local authority without always paying back either to the council's budget or the local economy in any way. If you ask anyone who lives by the North Coast 500 route, they will tell you of a personal costs that they have incurred as well, whether it's removing rubbish, repairing damage or claiming on their car insurance due to the state that the roads have been left in. And while increasing rangers could help with this, that is also a cost to the local authority, which has to come from somewhere. And I would much rather see a minimal charge to those using the council's roads rather than seeing my constituents' council tax bills go up to cover it. So I hope the minister will be happy to consider moving forward how we can look to charge these vehicles fairly and effectively without promoting displacement and irresponsible tourism. I'd be very interested to take part in the summer engagement that he mentioned. I also have great sympathy with Liam MacArthur's amendment, although I understand why it may not be suitable for this bill. I am glad that he put it down to allow this debate, and I'd be very keen to support his and others' calls for a levy on cruise ships at a suitable opportunity. We do see cruise ships arrive across the Highlands and Islands with more people on board than the population of the towns that they're visiting, and that is a lot for any local authority to deal with, even if some businesses do manage to take advantage, which many don't. If you support these ship visits or not as a local, it is hard to argue that there is an impact and that does often cost the public purse, even if it pays into private interests in other ways. So I'm glad to hear from the Minister that the door is open and he can expect me knocking on it soon. Thank you. Thank you. And I call on Miles Briggs to wind up and to press or withdraw Amendment th 22. Mr Briggs. Uh, thank you, Deputy uh, Presiding Officer. And I think... Um, this debate does sum up um, the difficulties and problems members are having across the chamber um, with the framework bills which government are bringing forward. It's all going to be detail another day. And, and the debate and argument the ministers put forward I don't think stacks up. The, the government have agreed to take out boat moorings and berthings from the bill, but have provided no clarification around other sources of um, holiday uh, lets, for example, uh, caravans, for example, should they be collecting the visitor levy when they're static holiday accommodation uh, used by individuals who own those? You know, the, the bill doesn't have any detail in it. And for that to be... Yes, happy to. Mr McMillan. I thank Mr Briggs for taking the intervention. Just on the point regarding the boat moorings, um, but Mills Briggs was in the committee at stage two uh, when I put forward uh, the amendment to have this removed from the bill. But Mills Briggs, I'm sure, will agree that people don't stay on their boats when there are moorings. I'm Briggs. not sure you could say 100% that that is the case, um, to be quite honest. I think people sometimes do. If they're travelling around uh, the country on them, they, they will. So um, I'm not sure what evidence the member is suggesting he can present on that. Uh, but this sums up, I think, the debate um, around how this will impact. Because from what the minister's outlined, people going to Highland... Uh, or people going to our national parks in the future could find that different parts of that park have different rules around camping, where they can park the caravan, whether or not they'll be charged. And I think that's ridiculous. I also think for people who, like I've outlined, trying to have a more affordable holiday, this will be an unwanted additional charge on them. Yes. Yep. Minister. 
Thank you, President. Officer, I'm very grateful to Mouse Briggs for giving way. It's, it's just to reassure the member that there has been um, extensive consultation and engagement, both with officials and me personally, with representatives of the uh, boating and marine tourism sector, but also having met with both of our national parks. And indeed, we have um, ensured that the legislation reflects the need for engagement with national parks. I would also just want to highlight, of course, that the chargeable event is that transaction when one is paying for overnight accommodation. That is where the, the levy would bite should a local authority introduce one. And the final point I would want to introduce is there is a flexibility within the legislation which allows local authorities to work together to develop a joint visitor levy scheme. Now, it would be for individual local authorities to decide whether to partner up, but that is something that could be applied in a situation where the local, over, local authorities overlap a national park, which would allow for a coordinated approach, therefore not risking the potential issues that Mr Briggs highlights. I think for businesses and for people trying to navigate this, we see the complex nature of short-term lets and what that has meant. This is going to be the same, if not worse. And I think that's where all the businesses who have been copying me into their uh, concerned emails to ministers um, hoped that there would be a more constructive uh, business reset which was offered to them but that doesn't seem to be forthcoming uh, from this government yes edward Bainter. i thank the member for taking an intervention I, i'm slightly confused here in the sense that we know across the highlands that not only do caravans use caravan parks but they also use local government approved uh, parking car parks where they're allowed to park overnight so it appears there would be some confusion there. And in a lot of cases, because the legislation has been removed, they just park in laybys. So it appears that some would be caught uh, by this legislation and others who are perhaps not following the rules as diligently as they should be would, be, would, would avoid it. It seems a mess. Would the member agree? I, I absolutely do, and I think this is where you know, we've reached stage three without the government being able to necessarily work with parties across this chamber, and we know there's a, uh, only recently that the government have had to do that, but this isn't an accept acceptable situation. I think it will see more cases of wild camping and clearly of people not going to organised uh, campsites and caravan sites. And I don't think anyone in the chamber necessarily wants uh, to see that happen, but that will be the only way of not then facing a charge of up to 10% or more. And, and when people travel around our country, having to then realise where they are and which local authority and whether or not they're being charged this uh, will become the norm. It is ridiculous and ministers should have actually looked towards fixing this before stage three. I therefore move Amendment 22 in my name. Thank you. Uh, the question is that Amendment 22 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. The Parliament is not agreed. There will be a division, and I would uh, remind members that as this is the first division of the stage three, I suspend for around five minutes to allow members to access the digital voting system.